Good evening, everyone. I'm Walt Jacobs, the Dean of the College of Social Sciences at San Jose State University. I'm one of three co-editors of Sparked, George Floyd, Racism, and the Progressive Illusion. I'll be the moderator of our discussion tonight. Welcome. We look forward to sharing and receiving insights. I want to begin by recognizing that we are on the ancestral homelands of the Dakota and Ojibwe people and pay my respects to elders past and present. I would also like to honor the past, present, and ongoing effort of the Dakota and Ojibwe people to steward and care for this land. I would also like to acknowledge the labor of Black enslaved people who lived and worked in Minnesota at one of our sites, historic Fort Snelling, located in Medote. These truths are foundations of our work to provide historical context to events yesterday and hundreds of years ago. And thank you to the Black Midwest Initiative for co-sponsoring tonight's event. First organized in the fall of 2017, the Black Midwest Initiative is a collective of scholars, students, artists, organizers, and community-involved people who are committed to advocating for the lives of people of African descent as they are situated throughout the Midwest and Rust Belt regions of the United States. Three brilliant scholars are on the panel tonight. Dr. Terriad L. Williamson, is an associate professor of African-American and African studies and American studies at the University of Minnesota, where she also serves as the director of the Black Midwest Initiative. She is the author of Scandalize My Name, Black Feminist Practice and the Making of Black Social Life and the editor of Black in the Middle, an anthology of Black Midwest. Next, we have Wendy Thompson Tywo. She is an assistant professor of African-American studies at San Jose State University. Her research and teaching interests include Black migration to the Bay Area, Black women and mothering, race and the built environment, and Black visual expressions of social status and class. And Dr. Yuhura Williams is Distinguished University Chair and Professor of History and Founding Director of the Racial Justice Initiative at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. Dr. Williams has appeared on a number of local and national radio and TV programs on ABC, CNN, C-SPAN, and NPR, and is author of, most recently, Rethinking the Black Freedom Movement. He also hosts the History Channel's web show, Sound Smart. Wendy is one of the co-editors of Sparked and contributed an essay and a poetic reflection to the book. Terriad and Yuhuru contributed essays. Thank you for joining us today. Let's start with a brief recap of the genesis of the book. The book originated in a conversation I had with Wendy shortly after George Floyd's murder. We both live in California now, but spent many years in Minnesota. After we discussed how race shaped our experiences in Minnesota, I decided to invite other academics who had lived in Minnesota, but now reside elsewhere to reflect on their racialized experiences while they were in Minnesota. From June 8, 2020 to August 31, 2020, we published an introduction and 21 essays on the social sciences website, the Society Pages. Those essays were from a wide range of authors. In October of 2020, I worked with the editors of the Society Pages to turn the essays into a book. The Minnesota Historical Society Press was interested, but wanted to feature essays by academics of color currently living in Minnesota, especially Black professors. I recruited Wendy and Amy August to be co-editors of the book. We chose 12 of the original essays to reprint and invited new authors to contribute to the anthology. 24 folks said yes. So the book has 36 chapters, plus a preface, introduction, conclusion, and discussion guide. Our goal was to get the book out just before the one year anniversary of George Floyd's murder. It was officially released yesterday. Let's start off by watching a video interview of one of the book contributors. Jason Marquiso. My essay is Whoop Whoop, That's the Sound of the Beast. When I came here in 97, I thought it was the place of milk and honey. You know, compared to what we was dealing with the war on drugs in Chicago, it felt right. I got fooled by Minnesota Nights. Nice. It's just all a facade, because when it's time to write up that paperwork for a loan, or it's time for me to like, really advance my situation and my family, that's when you're really not so nice. The true story of the police is, man, when we hear those sirens, when we hear them coming, we know it's nothing good for us. Even if somebody around us has called, still can end up being your last day on this earth. 
when people was talking about Philando being pulled over 54 times, I'm like, man, I probably had that amount in 98 alone. I don't know a life without police harassment. I never, I never experienced that kind of life. We shouldn't pay people to actually harm us. Like, it's rooted in anti-blackness. It's rooted in slave patrol. So I never know if I'm going to get lynched like George Floyd. So there's a ton of parallels. He kept saying, I'm a nice guy. I've said that to the police plenty of times. I'm a genuinely nice person. I walk my path. I love my mom. I do, I do good by the people around me. I was good as president in NAACP. George Floyd was telling him, hey, man, I'm not a bad guy. So in my article, I'm saying we can have safety without law enforcement. It's time to seek alternate forms of justice because the only form of justice for George Floyd would be for him to be reincarnated and have, you know, the rest of his life. And that can't happen. So we need true justice. That was a very powerful video, which definitely sets the stage for tonight's discussion. Backing up a bit, I should note that the title of the Society Pages series was Wonderful Wretched Memories of Racial Dynamics in the Twin Cities of Minnesota. That title sprang from the conversation Wendy and I had. My memories of Minnesota were very positive, but Wendy's weren't. She noted Minnesota was wonderful and wretched for Black people like us. Wendy, tell us more about that. Uh, thank you for the question, the prompt, Walt. Um, and I really appreciated um, Jason's video because for me, um, my experience in living in the Twin Cities um, was really um, marked by this succession of high key, um, violent, racist um, events that happened, right? So it was a lot more wretched for me. Um, so um, as Jason highlights, um, I was living in St. Paul uh, when Philando Castile was murdered by the police um, that same year, so it was 2016, um, in the spring, um, one of my students um, who was an artist and organizer and, and just an overall profound thinker who kept pushing me um, to think about the ways in which all of our institutions, right, all of the structures within our, within our society, society are grounded um, in white supremacist and settler violence. Um, Kirk Washington Jr. Um, was fatally and, you know, suddenly traumatically killed, right? Um, so that year, 2016, and, and, you know, was marked by these two deaths that um, were, that, that really shaped my understanding of my relationship to Minnesota. Um, and the next year, um, I gave birth to my son in 2017, um, surrounded by an all white medical staff um, who, I mean, in that moment, right? So uh, some of my research and one of the classes I teach is um, about um, racial health disparities, right? And, and especially uh, we focus um, on black maternal mortality and infant mortality in that class. And just to have, you know, to, to, to be in labor and have, um, you know, white medical staff tell you, you know, if you don't, if you don't sit still, and let us, you know, get this IV in. We're not going to call the anesthesiologist. We're not. You're not going to get the epidural, right? To like threaten me and to ignore my pain, right? After um, just a, you know, kind of living with the the loss and the grief of the year before, and giving birth to new life, right? Um, and all this happening in Minnesota um, really turned uh, the Twin Cities and and really the the whole state into this this trauma scape for me. Right, like this this place um, that was just um, very um, deeply uh, a deeply terrifying and violent place, right? And I mean, I also want to state that um, it's not just these high key events, right? These violent traumatic episodes that defined my experience and kind of blew back the lid or revealed the face of um, you know, the, the depths of racism and anti-Blackness in Minnesota, um, it was also these kind of mundane events, right? So um, going on walks in Highland Park where I was living with my family, um, 
and just having white folks drive by or white homeowners come out and, and look at us because there, there weren't a lot of black folks, black families walking around the neighborhood. Um, so, so this this sense that you don't belong, that you're you're suspicious, right? Um, even though you live in this neighborhood, um, and I mean other other um, events related to belonging, right? And this and this feeling that you could never really belong, um, and and this is linked to um, my experience as as a black parent um, having a child um, attend St. Paul Public Schools, one of the St. Paul Public Schools. Um, and um, one of the um, events that the school district um, has is the, the National African American Parent Involvement Day. But at my, my daughter's school, the principal decided to turn it into like an all, all parents, all families, right? So all Lives Matters type event um, because the sense was there, there weren't enough black parents anyway and the white parents felt some type of way about it, right? So, I mean, um, these were, you know, the 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 instances, the mood, the tone, the events, um, the trauma that really set the stage for me to see and experience Minnesota as this wretched, more wretched than wonderful place. Okay, thank you so much for sharing that, Wendy. Um, in the book, some of the new essays were influenced by essays in the Society Pages series. Yuru, your essay rests on Wendy's piece. Specifically, you discuss your transition to Minnesota from another state. Can you give us some of the highlights from your essay? You know, I can't, Walt, but I, I'm again moved by Wendy, and this is what happened last summer when I read her essay for the first time. I mm -hmm. think she says it in a way that's so compelling. Here you are giving birth, bringing new life into the world, and the phraseology she used in that moment to experience caregivers who threaten me and ignore my pain. That's the experience of being black in Minnesota, even as a transplant. And I, I talked about this in my essay, it's called Some a Abstract Place. Um, in the immortal words of the rap group, uh, Public Enemy, Minnesota is a different neighborhood. And I knew that in, in an abstract way coming here, but it wasn't until I was actually on the ground that I understood how uh, different the wound is here. Um, the word wretched is not inappropriate in any way. And wounds produce narratives. In order to experience the wound in Minnesota, one has to literally go through the process of witnessing, um, as Wendy put it, black life and death in the context of Minnesota. Um, this isn't Emmett Till. You know, this isn't James Byrd. This isn't the Genesis. Six. I did a, a documentary a couple of years ago on lynching, and I talked about how my parents had grown up in the shadow of Emmett Till. Um, I grew up in the shadow of Yusef Hawkins. My son will grow up in the shadow of James Byrd. Now my daughters will grow up in the shadow of Ahmed Aubrey and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. But it wasn't until I moved to Minnesota that I began to understand something that is central to Terry Ann's work. And that is that the uh, personal is political. This space matters. What happens here matters. And the contours of racial justice and racial inequality in Minnesota in particular um, produce a very specific type of trauma. And I was experiencing that as an outsider until the murder of George Floyd, till I understood it intimately. And my essay is really risk from, you know, um, being exposed in a very um, powerful way to that in Wendy's piece. And I'll give you another quick example. Um, after Dante Wright was uh, killed here, remember Maxine Waters coming to town and there was a bunch of controversy about what she said and people were so upset. Um, but they forget that when we talk about wounds producing narratives, uh, we go back to 1979 and here's Maxine Waters, the young California assemblywoman who's dealing with the murder of Eula Mae Taylor by LAPD in that moment. And what does she say in describing the shooting of this woman eight times by two LAP LAPD officers who had no reason, no recourse to violence? She says, look, they killed her over a $22 energy bill, gas bill, but more importantly, they killed her in her front yard in the eyes, um, in, um, you know, literally in the eyes, of, in front of the eyes of her own children. That is to experience, as Wendy put, put it, um, to threaten me and to ignore my pain. And that's why she was here. And again, um, I experienced it with her. As the outsider, people were saying, but you don't know, Minnesota is a different neighborhood. You got to understand the unique contours of Minnesota justice to really appreciate that and the experience of what it means to be Black and Minnesotan. 
Indeed, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Terion, your essay also talks about the trauma of being Black in, in Minnesota. Uh, your piece, Remembering David Cornelius Smith, uh, is uh, expands on a previously written piece that you wrote in uh, the June 11th, 2020 edition of Belt Magazine. Can you outline the main points of your very powerful piece? Yes, thank you, Walt. So Wendy used the word, um, the really appropriate word, I think, trauma, trauma scape. Yahuru talked about wounds producing narratives. Um, and I think that that's the, what it meant to produce this piece was to sort of talk through and think through some of that. So my piece, um, so I'll, I'll say this, in the aftermath um, on May 25th, 2020, I found out May 26th about um, um, George Floyd being killed and being here, um, I'm a North Sider, trying to figure out what what do you do? What do you do in that moment? So I did a bunch of stuff. I went to a protest. I um, I gave um, donated items for a food donation. I went and helped at a food donation. I did a number of things, but the thing, but the thing that happened that I think was the most useful in terms of my own skill set and has been the most profound and meaningful to me is writing the piece that shows up in the book. Um, in the aftermath of, of George Floyd's killing, a friend of mine who I had, hadn't and have not seen in many years post, started posting on Facebook about her brother. Her brother's name was David Cornelius Smith. I, had, I did not know her brother, um, but she started talking about her brother having been killed by MPD in a way that was very, Minneapolis Police Department, in a way that was very similar to what had happened to George Floyd. Had no idea about this. So I reached out to her, her name is Angela, and I reached out to her and I said, Angela, I didn't know anything about this. Would you be willing to talk to me about it? And we talked for hours and what was produced was, and we sort of went back and forth. Um, she helped me with the writing of the piece that um, ultimately ends up in Spark. And it tells the story of her brother um, who was born and raised in our hometown, my hometown in Angela's Peoria, Illinois. Um, he came to Minneapolis um, as part of Job Corps because he was um, he had to sort of get out. He had to do better. We grew up in the, all of us grew up in the hood. And what you're told is you got to go someplace else to do better, to get out, to improve your life. So that's what he did. And he joined Job Corps and he ended up in the Twin Cities. Um, and ultimately, his family believes that he fell into a depression. He was he ultimately was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And part of the part of um, the 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 clinical um, sort of the help that he was told um, that he needed as part of that was to get um, physical exercise. Right. So he joined the YMCA. The day um, that he had his police interaction, he was at the YMCA where he was because he was trying to get the physical exercise he needed as part of this mental health um, issue that he was dealing with. And um, it's contested what, what ultimately happened, what the newspapers um, and other sorts of sites will say was that there was this, um, the way that it was often narrated was that this, there was this homeless man who was mentally ill. I'm using for people who maybe can't see me, I'm using um, air quotes, I'm using air quotes here quote unquote homeless, quote unquote mentally ill man who was acting erratic. The police are called and essentially there's video out in, out there on, on the internet if, if it's something that one wanted to see. And they basically show them um, laying him prone in a position not unlike what happened to George Floyd. Consequently, um, um, there was a lawsuit um, and part of the lawsuit was um, that they were supposed to change their police tactics. And maybe we can talk a little bit about that later. But ultimately the, the point of the piece is to talk about the relay between the life of David Smith and the life of George Floyd. Um, and that there was a predictor to what happened and thinking about the meaning of what, what it is for a young black man to get out and do better and end up in the Twin Cities um, and end up dead um, as a consequence of an interaction with MPD. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Terry. I'm, and I'm going to stay with you in a minute. But before we go to that, just to let the audience know that in about 20 minutes, we'll get to the audience question and answer. So uh, if you're on Facebook, uh, can you please encourage uh, other folks, other friends and family to join in to the live conversation that's going on. So again, Q&A coming up in about 20 minutes. 
Uh, Terry, on one of the one of the one of the things that you talk about in your article again, you mentioned it very briefly a minute ago, was that David Smith's family settled with the MPD after filing a lawsuit. You wrote. The settlement also included an agreement that MPD officers would receive additional training on restraint tactics. This agreement, which provided the uh, systematic changes would be made within the MPD as a result of David's death, was of critical importance to the family. It provided solace that even if the officers who killed David would never be held responsible, and even if the settlement money would never bring David back, they could at least help ensure that no other family would have to go through the terror of their experience. Later, you note that David's younger brother said in an interview that my brother's death was supposed to save Mr. Floyd's life. How's the family doing after the David Chauvin conviction? And does it give us hope that true reform is on the way? Um, so what I'll say is, so I've had a conversation with Angela, David's sister, um, a sort of correspondence, um, a little, a, a few, not, not quite a week ago. Um, and I don't know. And the reason I don't know is I'm very careful about the questions I ask um, around these things. And because part of what Angela has told me and shared is that all of this, um, seeing George Floyd die and the way that that relayed back to what happened to her brother. And then um, she and I worked on this story. But after that, so Washington Post ended up doing a major story about um, David's case. And there are a number of other places where she then um, sort of told the story. As you might imagine, that was speaking of trauma, was also quite traumatic and very difficult for the family. And that is one of the things she said. And, and one of the things she's also said is the ways that as important, of course, as the story of George Floyd is, as important as it is to hold up the name of Breonna Taylor, as important as it is to talk about Dante Wright. There are ways in which she felt like David Smith's name, sort of people didn't know who David Smith was. Um, and there are ways in which even in the aftermath of all that has happened, they can the, the family continue to feel, um, to feel that way. And so there's been a lot of, um, I, I can't say, I can't speak for them exactly how they feel in the aftermath or about what happened with Chauvin, but I know in terms of their own feelings about their own loved one and what this has mean, meant for them, it has been extremely, extremely difficult to call all of this up um, again and again um, and to tell that story. Indeed, that's part of the trauma that you know we all experience. Is that even though how many folks that we, we hear about their stories, there's so many others that we don't. And you know when these things happen, just tra re traumatize us over and over again. Uh, Wendy and Yuhua, would you like to have any additional thoughts about the the Chauvin trial and what's telling us about the possibility of 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 reform? Um, yeah, I mean, I'd like to remark on that, but first, just to circle back to some um, two of the things that Tyrion um, mentioned. And also that Yohuru, I think, um, alluded to is um, one of the narratives. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was also a transplant, right? So coming from the Bay Area, from California to um, live in the Twin Cities. Um, but I met a number of Black folks um, who were in Minnesota who shared this narrative of um, migrating or, you know, arriving to Minnesota from an elsewhere that was more dangerous and more violent, right? And so it was part of a get out story, right? Getting out from a place um, where your quality of life and your lifespan, right, was ultimately going to be, you know, shortened um, and um, unnecessarily so, right? But to come to Minnesota, right, which, which was seen as like a, you know, a place where you could um, start afresh, right, where you, you had more resources, um, it, it gets turned on its head, though, right, the second, um, the, you know, these folks come here and, and encounter um, the stairs, the police, the, the um, it's, a, it's a passive aggressive anti-Black undertone within, you know, under, under the facade of Minnesota Nights, nice, right? Um, and then the second thing, Tarion, you, um, you mentioned and that, that um, I thought about too, is um, how these scripts or these, these, these narratives or even these labels, right? Like once they're deployed, um, usually by the police, right? But, I mean, but also the media traffics in, the, in these labels of, you know, this person's mentally ill, 
Um, this person is homeless, how easy it is to bury that person while they're still alive, right? Um, and so their murder by the police becomes this, I mean, all, it's a socially accepted thing, right? Um, there recently, so last year and this year, there, there were um, two individuals that I know of, multiple individuals, right? But two that I know of specifically, didn't know them personally, um, but one, one, one man down the street from my dad's house, right, um, was in Walmart. Um, and the police came in because, you know, somebody called the police, right? Um, maybe, you know, it was either because of, uh, you know, um, the man was suspected of, of stealing something or, you know, he, he also had a bat, right? And so the police come and shoot this man in the Walmart in front of the shoppers, right? Um, and then, you know, he's labeled as, well, he was mentally ill and he was threatening. And so, right, I mean, it, it, it doesn't become um, this national story, right? It's a local story. Um, similar thing happens in, happened in Danville about a few months ago. Um, a man, you know, who, he, he, he was labeled transient, right? Um, suspected of throwing rocks at cars. Police shoot him dead in the street, right? Um, and it, I mean, there's this, this list, but it's almost like if, if a person is not a perfect victim, then somehow, um, you know, the, the story just kind of goes under the radar, right? It just, it's, it's one of the many. Um, but just to quickly return back to your question, Walt, um, about the, the verdict, um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm old enough to remember, just like, I mean, everybody here, right? We're old enough to remember the Rodney King verdict, right? Um, and I don't know, I mean, I'm 40 now, and so, thinking about the weight of a verdict um, and what that means and what role it plays in you know, shifting the racial dialogue. I mean, unless a, that verdict is actually leading to us dismantling and, and, and really like um, rupturing these, you know, these, these um, systems, right? These structures of white supremacy, of anti-blackness, um, I don't really see the verdict is doing anything, right? Um, yeah, I don't know, Yahuru, what, do you, what are your thoughts? We're in the same place. I mean, I, I love a couple of things that you said. I, I think first and foremost, and I love the way that Tyrion put this, um, Jordan Peele has produced a genre of horror unique to black people because some people go into those films and just think of that as a film, but the reality is he's capturing um, what it, means to experience the trauma that we relive in this relay of death and never knowing exactly what, what your footing is and what your standing is in communities and having people you know approach you in a certain way as you as you described it Wendy is destabilizing it of itself of itself but it's a horror we live daily. Um, and you don't understand that. You know, it's hard trying to communicate that. I remember in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd, people reaching out, what books should I read? And and how can I um, support you in community? And I said, the most important thing you can do is understand the history. Um, and that history is only going to give you part of this. But as you were talking about this, Wendy, I'm working on a project now on the terrible summer of 1975 here in the Twin Cities, which for all intents and purposes was very much like 2020. There was uh, allegations of police brutality. Um, in the summer of 1975, a 13-year-old boy shot in the back by police. There was public outcry, three days of hearings by the Minnesota Human Rights Commission. Arthur Cunningham, the head of the NAACP in Minneapolis, comes out and declares that the MPD has declared war on Blacks and Indians. That is the language he uses. And there seems to be this push for reform. And then the criminal history of the 13-year-old boy comes out. All of that dissipates in a moment. In fact, it only seems like, to your point, Wendy, and I think it's such a good one, um, what would validate this moment, the Chauvin trial, because that's just a moment for me, um, would be legislation that grew out of this. Jimmy Lee Jackson and Viola Luizzo, we remember, because their deaths paved the way for the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So only if we get the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act will I believe that the Chauvin verdict will be memorable. Otherwise, we're what Terry Ann talked about, and this is, is critical. Dr. King in 1956, trying to, uh, 55, get the, you know, convict the people in Montgomery and staying off those buses for the women who started the Montgomery bus boycott. And here he is saying to them, you know, many of those names are now lost in the thick fog of oblivion. 
uh, the names of the people whose deaths we've experienced personally, who didn't rise to the level, and this is what's sick and twisted about this, of a Tamir Rice or an Eric Garner or a Sandra Bland. So I'm talking about the Raynette Turners and, you know, and who don't get a movie like Fruitvale Station. And the, the wound that goes along with that, but then also this idea that we have to recover those names. Um, Tyrion's piece spoke so poignantly to me because um, in speaking about Danville, I had one of my relatives and just doing my family history during the pandemic. And I discovered that, um, and I believe this is true of most black people, if we were had the capacity to do our family history, was killed by the Danville police in 1938. They crossed over state lines chasing him um, of, of suspicion of having moonshine. They knew where he lived. They had arrested him before. It was simply a question of them going back and um, you know, waiting at his wait, waiting at his home for him and rearresting him. Instead, they shot at his, shot out his tire. He crashed into a vehicle carrying two white farmers. And in that moment, 1938, which blew me away, the police officers were arrested for manslaughter, but not for the killing of the two black men in the car they were tracing, but for the killing of the two white men who the vehicle spun out of control and took out. And the trial basically was theater in which uh, the prosecution said, well. Um, this wouldn't have happened if these two black men hadn't been moonshining. And so that was appropriate. And so if anyone's to blame here, and so those legacies of injustice, which define our experience in so many um, powerful ways, make what Terry on wrote about meaningful for all of us. It's not just the Smith family, it's all of us that should wanna recover those stories so we can have a foundation for justice that begins not from reform, but from reimagination. Thank you so much. Yeah, the, the power of remembering our history and you know, thinking about it in, in, in new ways is, is so powerful. Um, we have about uh, nine minutes. We wanted to get to about around uh, 740 to go to question and answer. So let me throw in one more question here um, to, the, to the panelists. You know, several of the essays discuss the complexity of helping children understand and negotiate racism. Um, let me go. With, let me go to Wendy first. You know, your children are, are very young. Um, I think your daughter is ten, right? Or and your right. son is is five, I believe. You know, what are some of your thoughts about how we should talk to children about this this, this legacy, this history of, of racism, and how we should negotiate it? I mean, ultimately, it's every parent's decision, right? It's a it's a very personal decision. Um, for me, um, in my family, I've decided to um, talk very frankly to my children, despite them being so young. Um, I know that um, I've, I've, I've been chastised um, when, when I share this with other Black folks. Um, I've been chastised um, for um, you know taking away their innocence in some way, right, um, and, and traumatizing them. Right. Um, who wants to? I mean, from a, like, what, what's the right age? I guess. I mean, this is um, kind of a question that, that that many Black parents live with. What is the right age at which you should have such a talk with your child, um, or do you just wait? Right. Do you just wait for your child to come home from school one day and ask you, you know, I mean, what does the N word mean? Right. Do you wait for them to, you know, have to, to kind of harbor, right, the, this this real shame, um, this deep shame, um, because the teacher at school has asked them to play the role, right, or, or to think about, you know, what it would mean for them to be the slave, right, while their white classmates are given this um, this this um, sense of just being, you know, free and 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 um, kind of putting putting your child um, on display um, and creating creating the spectacle. Um, so, I, I mean, I've had, I've had very frank conversations with both my children. Um, and one of the reasons I've chosen to do this is because there is, there is, so two things, right? So the first, there is, there's no age that black children are ever really protected or safe from the, um, the anti-black violence outside, right? We've seen in recent times, uh, preschoolers being arrested by the police, right, in their in their daycare or school facilities. We've seen um, elementary school children, right, um, being arrested, um, being you know um, attacked uh, by not the school staff, secu you know, security. Um, 
And then, I mean, you have tweens who, who, um, who you mentioned, Tamir Rice, right? Um, tweens who are being shot by the police. Um, so, um, you know, for me, I don't feel like I'm not the one that's that's necessarily robbing my child of of innocence, right? I mean, white America is is comfortable doing that already. Um, but also, the second thing is it's important how you frame the conversations, right? Um, it's not just about so, I mean, we, we don't watch any of the videos. I don't like watching, the. I, I have no more capacity for watching, you know, um, people who look like people I love being murdered. Like, I just can't, um, and we don't do that. But, you know, in talking about, um, you know, and what are our people? And I, you know, and, and we, we talk about it like that, you know, I tell my kids, you know, like this is what's happening to our people, but our people are also responding in these other ways. And our people are also living in a system that we are pushing back against. Um, so I've decided to just go, you know, head, head in on this. Um, but I know you, you have an older, you know, a child. Um, I don't know what your conversations have been like. You know, it's it's interesting because I have a my son is older. When we moved here, he was a, a sophomore at university, and I have two daughters. Um, you know, my baby's just graduating from high school now, and I think Wendy, that's why your piece spoke uh, so directly to me last summer. Is that we're processing this in multiple ways, and sometimes people assume we're called on to comment, on um, to offer perspective from our academic from an academic lens, but as a parent. I was struggling because I had the talk. Um, and then I moved my son out here and I recognized that that's level set, game restarts, because this is a different territory. So I know what to tell him to avoid, how to behave, and, and it's not universal. I think that's one of the unique things that we've learned about um, in the last year, because look at the danger that Ahmed Aubrey faced, at least for some people, the danger that Brianna Taylor faced, you know, wherever you are, you've got to understand that landscape. And for people of color, this is part of the double consciousness that you invoked. But it's also a little bit of a, a triple consciousness in the sense of what Tyrion talks about. Um, I'm looking forward to her new work because I believe women in particular, African-American women, have been left out of this conversation in a way that's been detrimental to people understanding the depth of the trauma that our community experiences. And I won't go so as far as some people have said to talk about how we privilege black men in conversations about police violence. I will say that once you begin to examine the cases of young women of color, black women who were killed, like the girl in Columbus, Ohio, um, it's even more devastating because you realize it's not even just a question of black lives don't matter. It's a question of outright invisibility when it comes to black women. And that um, it is, a, is a trauma that we all as a community should be embracing and talking about. But I loved your frankness in your essay. In fact, I read it multiple times. I shared it with my network of parents because you spoke to it in a very genuine and authentic way in a way that I experienced it in that moment. I can't protect my child. I know that intellectually. I know what that looks like, but I needed to process that with another black parent in a way that said, um, number one, you're not crazy, but more importantly, you got to act because we have to, you know, I agree with you, burying our heads in the sand and pretending that this isn't an, an issue is not serving our community. When uh, people say stay woke, I, I think of it in, in the way that Ralph Ellison talked about an invisible man. We can't be a generation of sleepwalkers. We got to wake up the sleepwalkers. The sleepwalkers are killing our children, are perpetuating the school to prison pipeline and are denigrating um, the, uh, you know, uh, undermining the very fabric of American society and culture, um, which is problematic to begin with, but made even more so by the invisibility of the trauma inflicted on our community encounters like this. Indeed, indeed. So we've got a, a minute before we start the Q&A, but we'll, we'll delay it for a few minutes. I want to have one more question for Terriad. Um, so Terriad doesn't have children. I don't have children. You know, I've got two nephews and two nieces. What's the importance of relatives also speaking with children to reinforce the messages that they're getting from their parents? Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sidestep your question just a wee bit because, because I can speak about being a relative, but what I can also speak about, like we all can speak about, is being um, a teacher. So I don't have um, children, but I have students. 
Um, and I have had to talk, try to talk about all of this with students. I've had to talk about all of this in mixed classrooms where I'm trying to talk to my black students and say, wait, <laughs> I see you, I hear you, I feel you, and we ain't gonna act like it's business as usual because it's not. And we can stop all of this right here so we can have a conversation about how you're feeling, what you're feeling and what you need in this moment beyond this paper, this lecture, <laughs> you know, um, after Dante Wright was killed. That was right sort of toward the end of our semester when Dante Wright got killed and when the trial was happening, when the verdict came down, it was right like it was at the same time I was supposed to have my grad course. So we pushed the grad course back and then came on after the verdict and had to just sit and breathe together and talk about what that felt like. So part of it is like this ain't business as usual and you don't have to act like it is. Um, and being able to have really frank conversations with our students about that and finding a way, you know, one of the things I've been adamant about is finding a way, most of my classes end up being very mixed, to speak directly to my Black students and say, and what you are experiencing and what you are feeling in this moment is different, and we're going to acknowledge that. And so I guess the thing, the sort of final takeaway for me is what I want my students to understand. And it gets sort of to the point that Yahuru was making is about what I want you to understand is about conditions of possibility. So that is to say that I do work around, specifically around serial murder of black women, particularly within the Midwest. And the, the sort of disparities that um, get talked about in the book that both you, Walt, and Wendy talk about in the book, those sort of disparities that happen in Minnesota, those sort of socioeconomic disparities are deepest with, throughout the entire Midwest region for Black folks. And part of what I'm trying to do in my work is talk about the ways in which um, the lives of Black women are made so vulnerable, in part by those um, socioeconomic differences, which is to say that the conditions of possibility that can lead to George Floyd being killed on a street um, in the middle of a day are very similar to the conditions of possibility that allow for Black women to be killed one after the other, after the other, after the other, and don't nobody know about it, and ain't nobody saying anything about it those conditions of possibility are similar. So if we're gonna have a conversation, we should and can have a conversation about police brutality. We sh should and can have a conversation about what it means to defund the police, but that has to be tethered to, con to deeper conversations about the socioeconomic circumstances of our communities in the way that that's not even just a local thing, as much as we have to have localized conversation, that's also a regional and national thing, but that regional piece gets lost a lot. And that is what, I am trying to think through in my work and also what the Black Midwest Initiative is doing and why I think it is so essential to talk about Minnesota as located in a very specific place within the country. It's not just about Minnesota. It's also about what's happening within this entire region to Black folks. Yeah, thank you so much. Conditions of possibility is such a powerful concept. Uh, and again, you know, in, in the book, that's one of the things we get at is that the context that matters, you know, Minnesota is a case study that reflects, you know, the region as a whole and the U.S. as a whole. So many of the essays really speak powerfully to that to that concept. Thank you. And thank you to Wendy and Yuhuru also. Uh, we have a short, another video that we'd like to share before we get to the Q&A. Lots of questions are, are popping in, but let's first uh, check out one more video. This is by another uh, contributor to the, to the book. Uh, this is Mikkel M. Wright. My essay is called, It Shouldn't Be Me, You, But Especially Not Them, The Proximity of Black Trauma. In the Twin Cities, the Black experience has been unique. I think for me, coming uh, from out of state, I was shocked to see as many Black people as I did see. We're just trying to live, <laughs> live life regularly. Black annihilation is just the trauma and structure of Black death being seen everywhere. And it's not using a turn signal for Sandra Bland, sleeping at home for Breonna Taylor walking out of a store for George Floyd. And it's like, these are things that we're doing every day. These are life experiences. Black death recorded and replayed and re recirculated, retweeted, liked, posted, commented. It's everywhere. I've now come to understand what Minnesota nice is and what that means. And I mean, I honestly just thought people were nice. I didn't, I wasn't picking up on what it is to be Minnesota nice and regular nice, I guess. You know, we have beautiful summers and great springs and all these lakes. It just doesn't seem like a place that this happens here. I don't know if that means we think black people 
die and face trauma in places that don't look like this, right? Or maybe heavily, heavily populated black places, but it, it happens here. It doesn't matter that the sun is shining, you know? They kill black people in the daytime. They kill black people at nighttime. We have to continue to stay safe and stay safe with one another. Black people don't get the luxury of regular encounters with the police. Black people have to continue to take care of one another. All right, another very powerful piece. Uh, just a quick note that both videos will soon be available on the Black History Black Voices website. So we definitely invite viewers to learn more about the Black History Black Voices initiative. Um, and also keep an eye out for our next program coming up in June. Details will be posted on our Black History Black Voices website. So next, let's go to some questions and, and answers. So they'll pop up on our screen and I'll direct them to uh, the panelists to answer. So the first one is from uh, Michael Gillis. Uh, have any of you or any of the other essayists discovered possible reasons or causes for this in Minnesota? In other words, what is it about Minnesota that makes this possible? Who would like to take the... I'm wondering what the, this is, like what part, what, what, what are we talking, like did the police killings or anti-blackness or white supremacy, right? Because I mean, this is, this is the same state that was once the D Dakota territories mm -hmm. where Dred Scott, right, was crossed over, right, mm -hmm. from a slave state into the territories and was still kept at Fort Snelling. Mm -hmm. This is where, I mean, there was an execution of Dakota men down in Mankato um why wouldn't it happen here maybe one thing we can add maybe this can maybe get a little context to it is you no know, the book is called uh, george Floyd's racism and the progressive illusion so some of the essays talk about how minnesota has this very progressive reputation that things are great in minnesota we're not like the rest of the country uh so maybe that's that particular concept what do you, what do you think I think, you know, just very briefly, because I actually, um, I had an experience after Ahmed Aubrey was killed. I just want to coast on what um, Wendy was saying, of going out to Fort Snelling to do my uh, 2.5 mile run in honor of Ahmed Aubrey, and getting out there and having this moment of looking at the image of the two uh, Dakota leaders who were executed and recognizing that, as Wendy said, this is about white supremacy. This is about settler, colon settler colonialism. This is about you know, all those things large writ. And yet at the same time, this is an American phenomenon. It's a global phenomena, which has a lo local contours that we have to understand. Minnesota is not unique because the six degrees of segregation that we find here in housing, education, access to places of, of public accommodation, denial of, they, they, they exist every place. But they exist here in a context that it's important for people to be able to appreciate and understand. The danger in the question is, we don't want to get in the space of also then um, thinking about Minnesota exceptionalism. That's always been the problem is the, the window, um, Governor Anderson on the cover of Time Magazine in 1973, this notion of Minnesota exceptionalism, um, what got left out in 1973 is that black folks weren't included in that utopian vision of what Minnesota was in that moment. That's always been the problem. So, you know, I, I think not to be unfair to the question, but to just reinforce what Wendy said, at the core, this this is an American this, a global this. This is why the murder of George Floyd resonated all over the globe. But at the same time, it's one where we have to understand this in the context of what happened to the Dakota and Jibway people here. We need to understand it in the context of Dred and Harriet Scott. We need to understand it in the context of the way that redlining played out in this state. Because the contemporary challenges that we deal with are informed by the, those historical um, connections. Yes, I just remembered Rondo too, right? Didn't, didn't the I nine was it I ninety five, right? So, so the highway runs right through uh, a predominantly black, the pre predominantly black neighborhood in St. Paul. Uh, but I think Michael Gillis, um, thank you for your clarification, um, is speaking to the paradox of Minnesota nice. Um, how do we? I guess like how do we negotiate this? This um, I mean, what is it, right? Like this, 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 this. Um, it's not. It's not just a slogan, right? Or is it, right? Like under the "Welcome to Minnesota," it's not Minnesota nice with like a little smiley face, is it? Um, but I mean, it's definitely something that we associate 
um, the state with, right? This, this, this sense of, of a extraordinary niceness. How do, how do we reconcile that with the anti-blackness? I don't know, Terry on, um, you spoke to both, you know, a, a, a unique, I guess, culture and identity. You know, the, the, the state of Minnesota has its own unique cultural identity, but then also exists in the larger Midwest. Um, I don't know if, if you want to kind of grapple with this idea of Minnesota nice and, and the constant violence that Black folks experience here. Yeah, I mean, I think it gets back to what um, both of you have been talking about. I mean, this is obviously what we're talking about is something that is national and global in scale. It just has its sort of particular specific connotations within this place. And, you know, I don't know, where's Minnesota? I don't know, like maybe Minnesota's nice because ain't enough black folks here, right? Like maybe, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I don't know, you know, like the idea of Minnesota nice, like what is it meant to, like, what is it, what is it um, disguising, <laughs> right? Because as soon as you get here, at least for me, I moved here, I think it's been about five years ago now, you start to recognize um, that there's a kind of veneer. And perhaps also um, it has to do with um, sort of segregation patterns. It has to do with how um, the, 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 the numbers and the population, right? People don't talk about like Illinois nice. They don't talk about Chicago nice. Why not, right? So I think all of that comes into it, but ultimately what we're talking about is something that is absolutely um, national and global, but it has had these connotations here. And I think those connotations resonate in different ways throughout um, throughout the region. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We've got a next question coming in from uh, Christopher Garrett. He says, how do we as black men change the narrative when there are already these long standing preconceived notions that fuel and justify the use of excessive and at times deadly force by law enforcement? You already want to take, uh, take the first stab at that one? I will, but I, I'm actually very curious to see hear Tyrion's uh, take on this. Uh, but I'll just say that it's not our responsibility or duty to change the narrative. That's the problem, is that the police, the larger society and culture has that responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people like Robin DiAngelo's uh, White for Julie or Ibram Kendi, How to Be an Anti-Racist, and those were fine books. I think what connects them to this question in particular is the responsibility that the white community has to take on in dealing with its own um, racism. That the American dilemma, um, as Gunnar Myrtle uh, argued in 1944, isn't a black problem. It's a problem of white racism. It's what white, the white uh, community projects on communities of color and African Americans in particular, where we're the baseline of that um, derision. Todd Lawrence talks about this in his um, essay. Um, there, in fact, there are several essays in the book that address this you know, in a powerful way, Keith Mays um, and others. But for me, I think the, the challenge is that, you know, the things that we ask of ourselves or that we caution young men of color to do, black men to do, um, haven't saved any lives. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't mean that in a way that they may spare me an encounter, so I live to die another day. And I'm not say, I'm, I'm deliberately saying that in a provocative way, because there but for the grace of God, Freddie Gray, Tamir Rice, um, you know, any of those people could be any of us under the wrong circumstances. And that's what's so terrifying about these conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, who you said it before, I, I could, right? Like, it's not on us to change narratives and there's not enough narratives we can change um, to, make, uh, to make ourselves not vulnerable, <laughs> right? Um, at any given point in time, any of us can be um, the, the targets of police of, of police brutality and other forms of brutality and other forms of vulnerability that are that are maybe state sponsored, maybe or not, that are also intramural, um, intra-racial forms of violence that are also derivative of um, forms of state violence, um, for instance. And so you know, I, I, I'm with you. I don't think it's an issue about what we change. And I also think that plenty of folks who are men 
who are women, who are non-binary, who are LGBTQ, have been um, doing, have helped us see and do the work of what it might be to imagine differently or to be able to move through the world differently. And there's all sorts of work out there. Um, and a lot of these young folks who have been the ones who have been out there in the streets or who have been the ones who have been behind the scenes or um, have been the ones doing writing the things who have been showing up in our classrooms, those of us who have been teaching, there are a lot of us who have been doing the work um, across genders, across sexualities, who have been thinking about how to imagine the world differently so that we can live in it in a way that we don't have to talk about changing, changing narratives. Sure. Um, I just want to add one more thing. Um, I really appreciate um, all of us and all of just every single Black person who I've seen um, who have been pushing, you know, these white folks who get white and, and other non-black folks who come out and as, as allies, right? Pushing them um, beyond the, the anti-racist book clubs, right? Because I think that's one of the, the um, I guess threads of, of Minnesota Nice um, that I've noticed is, is that Minnesota, white folks specifically in Minnesota are too nice to be racist. And here's the proof, we're in a book club, right? We're, we're part of this anti-racist organization. Um, we're working on ourselves. Um, but I mean, back to the question or just thinking back about the question back about the question um, regarding the the um, the chauvin verdict, right? I mean, I think that the guilty verdict kind of allowed not just white folks in Minnesota, but just I mean white folks in America to to just kind of feel like they were off the hook, right? or or just feel like, okay, good. look, our our this is proof. Our justice system's working. He's a bad apple. This is what we've been saying, right? And and you know we're not racist. It's that man over there, and and now he's going to pay for it. And and this means that we're moving forward, and we don't have to talk about it. We don't have to look at how we're invested in it. We don't have to look at how our choices, um, whether it is our choices to live in segregated neighborhoods, our our choices to hoard resources, putting our kids in the same school, excluding other kids. Um, we don't have to look at how any of this is um, upholding these these systems that that perpetuate right um, black death, whether this is you know police linked to you know state sanctioned police killings of black folks um, or slow deaths, right? So like thinking about um, black folks having to live um, in areas that are in close proximity to to you know um, environmental hazards and, and toxins, right? Um, yeah, y'all need to do, not, not us, right? Like y'all, you know who I'm talking about, right? Y'all need to do more work. <laughs> indeed, indeed, Wendy. I think we have time for two more questions. We're gonna go a little bit long. So here's the, here's the next question from uh, uh, Annie uh, Kuthert. What are ways that you either see currently or imagine for the future that will help address the traumascape of racism in Minnesota? ways that are or will heal the wounds? Can every single medical center in Minnesota hire black doulas and black midwives? Like, can we give birth with other black people in the room with us who are part of the medical staff? Like, I don't wanna be wheeled yeah, so this is really personal, sorry. But I don't, don't want to be wheeled down a hallway and look at the entire, right, like in, in the, in the, right, well, the birthing center, right, all of the staff, and it's just, it's just an ocean full of whiteness. Like, can, can, can we do that, right? Like, so I mean, I, in, in, more, more black teachers, more, I mean, I, I don't know, like, can it just, I just, this is me though, right? I just wanted all black everything infusion all around me. Like, I just want it everywhere, so. Speaking of all black everything, um, so, so my first reaction to this question, honestly, is to be like, you know, it's hard to heal wounds that are constantly being reopened. Um, this is what happened with the Smith family, right? They were trying to heal and 10 years later, it just sort of um, whatever scabbing might have been there just sort of gets gets, gets sort of um, um, ripped off in this really vicious sort of way. So there's that. But um, setting aside that also, speaking of all black everything, like I just want to say that black organizations and black people and black residents and black communities 
very often, almost always like know what they need. So what I want to say is um, to to like to support black led organizations. And not, so one of the things that happens here in Minnesota is there's a lot of folks who are doing work in the name of that aren't necessarily led by that get support um, and other kinds of groups and organizations don't. We should listen to the work that Black folks are doing, and we should know that even if someone is living in, say, North Minneapolis, where I'm at right now, holla, um, even for folks who are living places like this, who might not have all the degrees and all that stuff, they still know what they need, and they can tell you what they need, and they can tell you what the resources are that they need. They can communicate that, and they probably know best how to get to the to get those resources implemented. So, like just hearing and listening to and being led by, allowing ourselves to be led by Black folks, I think is part of part of what we need to do too. Indeed, thank you so much. I think we have one to add for me, and I'm like, I can't add on anything that was shared except this. I sometimes worry about when people lead with healing, not because it's not a good impulse to want to think about and imagine what we could be in the future. Um, but I think about what Leslie Redmond said in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd that upset a lot of people, where she described Minnesota as a white Wakanda, where ultimately this is a fantasy for white people um, in some sense, and there's a lot of trauma for black people. But I also say with regard to the question of healing, I mean, healing requires that you go through the pain. And I think sometimes when we talk with or lead with healing, it assumes that how do we minimize the pain? And this is a pain like in order to get to the other side, there's a whole lot of hurt that has to happen. There's a whole lot of discomfort. There's a whole lot of, you know, being in the shoes of others and, and, and hearing things that are not palatable and not being fragile in those conversations to recognize that when somebody says, can't we have more black teachers or can't we have representation of African-Americans in um, critical services like medical? Or can't we talk about equity and justice? That it's not about you. It's ultimately about us as a community. That's what community means. Healing that begins with the premise of how do I feel better and not how do we feel better is not community at all. It's vanity. Mm -hmm. and carry on. I think you had one more uh, item before we go to the last question. Something I just want to add real quick. Again, this is on that all black everything thing kick um, there. The Black Midwest Initiative in the wake of David Smith's um, the, the essay that I wrote um, about David Smith launched a scholarship fund. And you can find out more about it if you go to the black dot com forward slash scholarship. It is specifically for um, students who will be attending community colleges in the Midwest. So if you would like to donate to that fund, or if you know we're taking up, um, accepting um, applications up until the 30th of the month, you know a student who will be good for that, please, please share that information. It's just another way with that we're getting David's story out um, and honoring his life and his legacy. So that's what I wanted to say that real quick. Cool. Thank you so much, Terry. It's so important to have these practical steps to help us you know, move forward. Uh, I think we have time for one more one more question. Uh, when you first read the full collection of essays, what feelings, thoughts, responses did you come away with? When we first read the full collection of essays, what feelings, thoughts, responses did you come away with? And then Wendy, maybe I should start with you because you know we we edited the book and we we were reading them as they as they came in. Um, Maybe I'll just I'll add this real quick before we go to Wendy. You know, we uh, the essays came in. They were very powerful, of course, very personal. We took a very light touch in editing them. You know, pretty much as is. Maybe a few typos were corrected, but we really let the the authors you know, speak their speak their truths in the way that they wanted to speak, and we thought that was very very important. So we didn't we didn't really edit it much. When I first read, or, or when I first heard this question, right, posed, I felt like this was a question that we should be posing to our audience, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I know that the book just dropped, so they might not have read the full collection yet. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, it, it, you're right. Well, it, it was a phenomenal um, chorus, right, of, of um, folks, Black folks, um, Asian American folks, I mean, um, other folks of color, 
our, our two white contributors, yeah, mm -hmm. right? Like, it, was, it was a beautiful chorus of, of folks um, speaking um, both their truth of, of living in um, the Twin Cities, um, in Minnesota, um, you know, living through the execution of, of George Floyd, like living in the moment, living in the Twin Cities, watching, um, you know, parts of the city, uh, of the, the Twin Cities burn, right? Um, and then also folks who lived in Minnesota have fond memories or, or you know, um, conflicted, conflicting memories, um, it, um, not conflicting, right? right? Fraught memories, right? Of living in Minnesota who are not there anymore. Um, kind of speaking back to those experiences, I think um, it provides um, this this really unique. Um, I don't know. So, like, I always think in terms of food or or plants, right? But I mean, it's it you know, it's it's this this um, buffet, right? Of, of of folks speaking to to you know all these different issues, um, talking about things that they hold very deep to that deep deeply to them right talking about raising their children in minnesota um talking about building community um talking about um supporting other folks um in the aftermath of um george floyd's murder right so i mean it was it was very moving um and it did create um this this bond, I think, you know, between the three of us who are editing the collection, um, because I mean, we, we just, we would sometimes just, you know, read a piece and then we would have to kind of immediately call each other and, and um, talk about, well, what did you think? Oh my gosh. Right. Like, um, it was just, it was awesome. Period. Um, I'll just say really quickly that, um, <laughs> I felt seen. Um, I haven't read the whole, I've read most of the book. I haven't read the whole thing, but it turns out that every place in the Midwest is not like every other place. Um, I'm from the Midwest. I've lived a lot of places in the Midwest and different places feel different. And this place feels different. This place feels different than Peoria, where I grew up, Chicago, where I went to undergrad, Michigan, where I've lived. Um, and just knowing that there are other folks who are having similar kinds of feels and experiences and who have been over the course of this past year thinking some of these thoughts along with you, um, having the, one of the words I've been using a lot to talk about my work and the things that that I do with folks is like gathering. And this is another form of a gathering that I think is so critically important and a gathering of of the voices of the people who are among those who are the most deeply impacted. That is really critical um, for us as, as well as for anyone else. Uh, I, I will say and, and I just want to acknowledge, Wendy, I just want to thank you again, because if you knew how important that essay was to me last summer when I read it, when I got the advanced copy and I was able to take a look at all of them in um, concert, I'm including Tyrion and it's been an honor being on with you tonight because that was a deeply impactful essay for me as a historian, um, just kind of watching you work through that case and describe that and Walt. But for me, it's Marshall Williams' essay, Will Words Lead to Actions? And I think she says it beautifully. I, I, would, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't say that you shouldn't go out. Maybe we need to come back in the fall once people have had an opportunity to digest Sparked and see if you're sparked by some of the incredible scholarship and personal reflection that's um, captured in this book. Because for me, what was so moving, and I'll say this again, um, many people know Wendy is a phenomenal scholar. It was the fact that she was able to take a step back and to expose in a very um, intimate way to be vulnerable in a way that actually is the foundation for building community when we talk about healing, where there's pain, there's life. In a moment when we're talking about so much death, we have to find space for shared humanity. And I think Sparked is the first step toward that. It's why I was proud to be a part of this project, why I'm honored to be on with you, and why I think everybody needs to pick up this book and ask the question that Marsha does. Will words lead to actions? Thank you, Yuhur. That's a really great way to start for us to wrap up. I really second that. I think we should start working right now on having another event, you know, in the fall after folks have a chance to really read the book and reflect and think about what we can do, um, move to, to, to heal and move forward and to make uh, lives a little bit better for, for all of us. 
Um, so with that, let me um, thank the panelists once again for very powerful contributions, not only tonight, but also to the book, Sparks George Floyd, Racism and the Progressive Illusion. Uh, many thanks also to the audience for, for joining us. Uh, last thing I'll, I'll note is um, you know, please keep an eye out for the next program coming out in June. So you can take a look at the at our website, Black History, Black Voices website for more information about that. So once again, thank you so much to everybody who joined us tonight. Uh, please have a good night. Thank you. <laughs>